Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in today's video we're going to be talking about the history of the tank. Now I've done a lot of history videos before and I've done a lot of tank videos before but today marks the occasion that uh, is kind of special in history and of course in tank history. 100 years ago, exactly 100 years ago, this is when the tanks were actually introduced into the warfare. And today we're going to briefly talk about this history that you might not be familiar with, and I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about what I'm playing here as well. Welcome to What The Math. <laughs> So I'm actually playing uh, my one of my most favorite games, Hearts of Iron 4, that I'm still kind of planning to do as a playthrough as well, as a historical playthrough. But here we're basically using a mod called Gerald's World War 1 mod that uh, is essentially, it's a transformation mod that changes the game into the First World War. And here everything starts with 1910, where basically the war is about to begin. Now, what I really wanted to talk about, and of course, the, in this game, when you just started, there is actually no tanks. It's the research that will take you quite a while to get, and um, it will be not before 1915, 1916 that you'll actually see your first tanks. But uh, what I really wanted to s talk about is basically what tanks were and what how they were actually developed, because it's actually, you know, it's a tank's birthday, 100th birthday, as a matter of fact. And all of this really started back in World War I, where essentially uh, Germany or German Empire was uh, fighting alongside with Austrian Empire and a few other countries against uh, the Russian Empire, against French and the British. And here uh, there was actually kind of a stalemate that was reached where um, well, it was really known as a, as a trench warfare where no country was actually advancing and a lot of countries were just losing people left and right. Uh, millions and millions of people died in trench warfare and it wasn't really going very well for either country. And so a new weapon had to be developed for this stalemate to be broken and this is essentially where many different countries started to actually try different things. And the main demand here was for some kind of an armored vehicle that was actually able to uh, break through these defenses without really, you know, killing its crew or without getting damaged itself. Now, early armored cars were pretty good at uh, being defensive, but because of their wheel structure, they weren't actually very good at um, moving around terrain, specifically trench terrain, and they would always get stuck and people would always get killed inside of them. So instead of using these armored vehicles, uh, the British and also um, a few other countries started to independently develop uh, these special weapons. As a matter of fact, this was a super secret weapon back, th back then. Nobody knew about it, nobody was allowed to know about it, not even soldiers. And the only task that this weapon had was to essentially cross the killing zone between trench lines and break into enemy defenses. And one of the main reasons this uh, development for the secret weapon was finally possible uh, and why it wasn't possible before is was because the British and, and the French were actually able to develop the internal combustion engine uh, using essentially the American vehicles that eventually made it to Britain as well. So they used the same kind of internal combustion engine uh, to create these very, very heavy and very robust vehicles that were later known as tanks. Because before that, the only way that they could actually transport things and materials was with horses or with uh, normal vehicles like trucks, which weren't really that effective um, on the front line. But actually, the original concepts for uh, these tanks were um, even earlier than 1916. As a matter of fact, one of the first concepts was from a French artillery captain named Lavasseur, uh, who uh, basically proposed uh, the so-called Lavasseur project, which was essentially a turret or an artillery turret encased into some sort of a um, very, very hard to break shell. But nobody really took him seriously back then and his project was actually abandoned in 1908 because most people thought it was kind of useless. And of course, science fiction picked up on this story and actually H.G. Wells, which is a very, very famous science fiction writer, actually had these so-called land ironclads, basically protected uh, ships that were moving on land um, as part of his um, short story that was published in the Strand magazine. And uh, he basically kind of possibly even was partially responsible for the development of tanks later on because it really always starts with science fiction. So he kind of put that idea into the head of the military that was then able to actually recreate the designs as well. But the majority of these designs were actually more like tractors. They were basically these vehicles that were able to move 
move heavy things around, they were able to uh, move around difficult terrain, but they weren't really meant for combat. As a matter of fact, the American designs, or earlier designs, were mostly tractors, they weren't really tanks. But pretty much every major country that was at war was actually working on some sort of a design, so they basically all had a very similar idea to create some sort of a vehicle that would actually be able to cross the trenches and to break through defenses and essentially overwhelm the uh, soldiers that were hiding in those trenches. And so even the Russians were actually developing their own versions of the tank, but theirs were, as always, very extreme, very, very large. One of them was actually called the Tsar tank, which was a ridiculously huge wheeled vehicle that uh, never really made it past the design stage, but it was essentially a big tricycle that would always get stuck in the trees. Uh, and uh, basically every single country was developing them, but it was really the British that were the most successful. As a matter of fact, Winston, Winston Churchill, who later became the Prime Minister of Britain uh, during the Second World War, was actually very excited about these tanks and he was encouraging the, uh, the Navy and the Army to basically continuously try to create a design that would be able to break through the trenches. But by about June 1915, many of these ideas were just failures, they were either too bulky, too funny looking, or just would get stuck everywhere. And interestingly, then the British got really lucky. So even though their previous designs actually were failing, they ended up creating this really interesting rhomboidal design. Basically, it was a rhombus-shaped tank uh, that would later on be known as Mark I tank. Uh, but this first model was simply known as His Majesty's Landship Centipede, or later now known as Mother. And this design was surprisingly successful at both crossing the actual trenches and breaking through the um, any kind of defenses, essentially. And so by end of January of 1916, um, very, very successful triers were actually completed, and the um, army has decided to order at least 100 units and to then place them into the western front of France, where they would later participate in the first ever tank battle at the so-called Battle of the Somme, where uh, actually Britain previously has lost quite a lot of different soldiers. But what's really interesting is that yeah, is the actual name tank. So the reason why we call tanks tanks is because of the secrecy around this project. Back then, uh, most of the vehicles were usually used to deliver some kind of a liquid, usually water or possibly fuel for other vehicles. And so the British decided to actually essentially masquerade or hide uh, these secret vehicles as the water delivery tanks. And they actually had the marking water delivery tank on on them or simply water tanks and so nobody was supposed to know that these were actually secret army vehicles that were supposed to change the tide of war but the word tank was actually referring to the fact that they were supposed to deliver water it was never meant to stick to them like it does today and so this is how the word tank was actually born it kind of stuck to the, this particular vehicle especially after the first victory at, at the Somme and uh, then every country adopted the term tank, and this is essentially what we know as tank today. And because these tanks were actually developed mostly by the Navy, um, this is one of the reasons why many of the different um, features on the tank actually has, have naval terms. So for example, all tanks have hatches, and hatch is something a ship would have as well. They also have a hull, uh, they have a bow and ports. And so all of this great secrecy and uh, strange terms were essentially perpetuated by the military and were simply kind of stuck to this uh, vehicle forever. So now we call them tanks and all of the parts on a tank also have naval terms. But before I actually finish this video, I actually did, did want to mention briefly the first battle that these tanks participated in, and this is of course in France, the so-called Battle of the Somme, um, under Field Marshal Douglas Haig. And so here there were 49 tanks of which 32 were actually fit to um, participate and advance through the through the trenches. And the idea for the French and for the British here was to essentially try to overwhelm the Germans and to go on a complete offensive um, at uh, the location uh, named after the river Somme. But nevertheless, this was actually one of the bloodiest battles um, in human history. And even though technically the British and the French kind of advanced about 10 kilometers into German occupied 
occupied territory um, and obviously the tanks were able to show how effective they were um, in the end what happened was that uh, there were huge huge casualties as a matter of fact the British lost about 420,000 people the French lost about 200,000 and the Germans lost about 500,000 so all in all over 1 million people died at this particular battle that only lasted a few months between July and November of 1916. So even though this battle was um, kind of successful and showed that tanks were very effective at breaking through different trenches and different defensive measurements, they nevertheless didn't really win the war. It still took at least a year and a half to win the war and millions more people will actually still die until the, the war actually ends. But nevertheless, that's beyond the scope of this video and really all I wanted to talk about is the fact that today marks the 100th day anniversary of the first use of the tank. Wanted to explain a little bit to you about how the tank started and of course explain the word tank itself. Now this game is awesome, if you still haven't tried it, give it a try. I obviously don't get paid for this promotion, I'm just, I love uh, Hearts of Iron, I really like Paradox Interactive games, and this is definitely one of my favorite games ever. Now there is going to be a full playthrough coming uh, sometime in the future, I'm actually still working on it and it's going to be a historical playthrough that will hopefully teach you a little bit of history. So do subscribe if you still haven't and if you love historical games. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate all of your support, thank you guys, I'll see you in the next video, game you later, and as always, bye bye.